Welcome to part 7 of the series on M5 forecasting competition. This is a continuum from the last video where we went through an overview of the steps to take for the ML approach. In this video, we're going to try the first approach, so directly using all historical sales values and one hot encodings of the product category and location as features, and ask the model to predict sales for the next 28 days as a multi-label regression problem. Before I get into how this is implemented, I just want to mention that with the three parameters I was tuning, I didn't see a significant improvement from the naive top-down method. We run the weight calculations as before and store it in a data frame. Create a data frame to store all the higher level aggregations just as before. And define our custom loss function. The panel's get dummies function converts all categorical features to one hot encodings. What this does is that for each column containing string values, it's going to make a separate column for each unique string entry, and then instead of having a string entry, the row would simply have value 1 in the respective columns and 0 otherwise. For example, the first row used to have a state ID of CA, and we know that the state ID column contains three unique values, CA, WI, and TX. So after docket dummies, the state ID column will be encoded as three columns, state ID underscore CA, state ID underscore TX, and state ID underscore WI. And the first row will have a value 1 in the state ID CA column and zeros in the two other columns. We want to get these one hot encodings for all the string columns except for the ID and item ID, because each row takes a unique value in these two columns, so it won't be useful training features as there won't be any generalizability. We also still need the original string ID values for aggregation purposes. So that's why I'm joining all the original ID columns in the front with the one hot encoding data frame. At this point, all of our features for X are ready and all of our labels for Y can be extracted. So our data frame is ready to be passed into an extra trees classifier. Instead of training a regressor with just the default parameters, here I'm setting up a random search for hyperparameters along with a threefold time series cross validation. I was only tuning for two parameters in the forest, the number of estimators denoted by n underscore estimators and maximum depth any tree in the forest can grow, which is denoted by max underscore depth. These ranges are roughly determined by some quick experiments and also to prevent the search from taking too long to exceed the maximum kernel runtime. You can definitely play around with these ranges, and also tune for other parameters by just setting a range for random value initialization and checking performance for using that random value in the forest parameter. The last parameter that I'm tuning for is the start date for the training set of the first cross-validation fold. As demonstrated in a previous video, the using just the same values of the last 28 days as a forecast gave us a decent result. Recency definitely matters, so history may only be relevant up to a certain day. And the idea here of choosing a start date is to feed the model recent historical days that are significant to our target. By tuning for a start date, we'll let the random search decide what's a good start date. Cross-validation here is implemented within the loop. I'm using three folds here because that seems to be the minimum number to use for cross-validation to still work, and that takes the least amount of time. If you're trying hyperparameter tuning, one thing I want to suggest is to get a rough estimate of how long the entire process is going to run for. For example, using a random search within a range of values, you can run one iteration with the parameters that will take the most amount of time and clock it. Then just set the number of random search iterations to some value that even if every loop takes around that time, this entire process will still finish within 9 hours. Well, that's just lesson learned for me after days of having multiple failed version commits for exceeding the time limit. For each fold in a cross-validation, First, we're going to initialize a new regressor with the random variables. Just a technical note here, you can define the forest outside of the CV loop, as long as the warm start parameter is false, and by default it is. We just want to ensure that the model for each fold doesn't have access to data from other folds, and without the warm start, every call to fit will fit a new forest, but I'm defining a new regressor inside the loop just to make it obvious that this is a new forest. Then, to keep the features consistent, we we'll need to select a different segment of the D underscore day number features for each fold. So say if the random start date is 1200. For fold number 1, we are only going to have features D underscore 1172 to 1857 as features in the training set X. 
and D underscore 1858 to 1885 are going to be our 28 dimensional labels. And for each increasing fault number, we're going to shift the train set back by another 28 days by toggling with the train start and train end date. Then for train set X, we're going to pass in all features except for the string ID columns and weights, which are just there for the score calculation purposes. And we're going to drop all the D underscore day number columns where the day numbers are not in the range between the train start and train end. For labels, we'll just segment out the 28 days after the train end date for this cross-validation fold. Then after the regressor is fitted, we just need to predict by shifting the training features 28 days back. So this prediction segment is going to be from our train start plus 28 days until train end plus 28. And with these training features, we'll be able to predict for days from train end plus 29 to train end plus 29 plus 28. Now that might be a little strange and confusing because usually the training and evaluation set are segmented out from the same data frame, but I did it this way for two reasons. First, to simulate the actual scoring process, which requires the entire data frame to be forecasted. And second is to simulate how it will be evaluated by a leaderboard. So for using this method, before submitting to the final submission file, we're going to use the same amount of the underscore features, but the last day will be up to the last day we're given, minus 28 and then using the last 20 days as the labels to fit that final model. So in that case, our train end will be 1885. And at this phase, the forecast days on the leaderboard are from 1914 to 1941, which is exactly 1885 plus 28 plus 1 to 1885 plus 28 plus 28. And the extra 1 is just added there because Python range function doesn't include the last value. After making a prediction, we'll just join the forecast data frame to df as forecast columns, name them in a way that's easy to find, and proceed with aggregation scoring. Then we get the wrmsse for this fold, and we can append that to a list we defined before the CV loop. When the CV loop finishes, we'll calculate the average of this list of scores for this set of hyperparameters, compare that with the current best score, and store the current model as the best model if the score is better than the best score before. Just make sure to set the initial best score to some large number, and if you're tuning for anything other than model parameters, like the start date, remember to store the random value for each of these parameters once a new best score is found. After a random search loop terminates, We'll fit the best model again with the best start date until 1885, and the training labels will be from 1886 to 1913. Then for the prediction part, shift the feature dates 28 days back, so from the best start date plus 28 to 1913. And then the output from the regressor will be the respective forecast for days 1914 to 1941. So we'll just write these in the format we want our submission CSV to be in and again fill in the dummy values for the evaluation days, append the dummy forecast, and write the entire data frame to submission.csv. The RAM search process takes a long time, so I'm not going to run it right now, and I'm just going to show you a version of RAM before. One concern I've been having is that, as you see with the cross-validation, forecasting on different parts using the same methods yields different results. I feel okay about this because it makes sense if the sales become irregular or more unpredictable from time to time. But the thing that bothers me is that sometimes one model does better than the other overall when I take average of the three folds, but it might be worse than one of the folds. For example, this parameter yields a score of 0.86 in the second fold, and overall yields an average of 0.8386. So that's better than the 0.84 these set of parameters yields. But these set of parameters actually yields a score of 0.859 if we're just looking at the second fold. So I wonder if with the leaderboard score on the validation set, we're just going to keep building models that slightly overfits on the validation set. But I guess that's probably a question for later once you have a really good model that you're confident about. As I mentioned, by just tuning these three parameters, I didn't find the result to improve too much from the naive top-down method. However, with the amount of resources I've devoted, I cannot say for sure that this method is flawed by nature. And by that, I mean some methods are internally flawed because, for example, there's just not enough information. I mean, maybe it hasn't found a good enough parameter with just 50 iterations. Or maybe I need to tune for more hyperparameters than just three. 
but I'm leaning towards trying the second approach first and see how that goes because I feel like that format is better with encoding more information and I'm seeing leading scores with published notebooks using that data format. This notebook is made public by a team who's ranked pretty high up in the leaderboard. I find this very useful to learn from and I'll leave the link in the description below. I'm still going to try the second approach from the last video, even though my idea of data transformation and feature engineering there was kind of just a simplified version of the great work this team had done, and I probably wouldn't achieve as high of a score as this right here. I still want to try it because I think it's interesting when two ideas go in a similar direction, but one performs better. It will offer some insight to what's playing an important role in achieving a better result. I'll end the video right here. As always, please stay safe and happy. See you next time.